footy page on the website? They are. When they get there. Sometimes, okay. sometimes there's a little delay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, <laughs> will that be something that we'll do sort of going forward? Or are we going to maybe publish or post maybe the last? So the months? video will be posted on the website um, for minutes. And so it's just a matter of keeping it up. And okay. anybody that wants to help with that, okay. come see me. So we're going to watch my language, too. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are recording now, Larry, so hold back those so F-bombs. Watch it. <laughs> um, all right, so for the benefit of the recording, we've called to order the meeting. We've accepted our minutes from the last meeting, which was, my goodness. January 27th. January 27th, perfect. Um, hopefully, we'll see Mayor McEachern at some point this evening. Um, so the next on our next point on our agenda, and I'm sorry, what I didn't do up here was who is leading each of these agenda items. So I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, but for climate action plan next steps, um, I'm not sure if if Effie you would like to. I know you had the majority of our next steps as far as the climate action plan. Um, well, and um, if anyone else wants to pitch in, because I know there was obviously a lot of activity at City Council and in. in um, voting on the capital improvement plan as well, of which this was included, so. Great. I'll let me so at the on. last meeting, um, Peter had to be out, and we talked about whether it would be possible to issue the RFP earlier and wondered what kind of resources we could get together. So um, you all got with the agenda a short, like, resource list of mm -hmm different links for different cities RFPs and the one from Civ Forge that Bert introduced us to some time ago. Um, so the idea was, you know, does it take a city council motion authorizing a release of an RFP contingent on funding? Because the funding, even though the CIP, I think is March 7th, the vote? The next city council meeting. Okay. So I believe that's March 7th. Um, that, that funding will not be definite until the fiscal year starts in July, is my understanding. It could, it could be withdrawn after the vote. So I'm wondering, you know, just because what we've seen from other cities is it can take a year and a half to put a climate action plan together. If we issue an RFP, even if we had it out July 1st, having the bidders look at it and get back to the city and evaluate the RFPs adds months to the process. And that's why we were talking about, could we get the RFP out early? So Peter, I don't know if you want to chime in at yeah, this Yeah, I will. Point. Yeah, so the, um, so the CIP is the first step in the process of getting the climate action plan going. There's 50,000 that the council needs to adopt the CIP. I don't think there's a, any objections that have been stated to that so that should go forward and then to to really turn it into a budget item they have to adopt the budget with that in there so that's the next step that has to happen that'll happen in june or july so the fiscal year starts july 1 with the budget will hopefully be adopted a little before that so if you wanted to do it with no risk you'd wait till that july time frame to release it um, you know there could be a caveat in the rfp pending city budget approval if you really wanted to get going early i don't think it would need a vote it wouldn't it wouldn't need a vote of the council the council's authorizing the pro process that's their role the next step is you know the city manager would play a role and staff city staff would put the rfp together and follow our purchasing guidelines we need to get you know a certain number of app, uh, uh, app, applicants or proposals in and then review the proposals and and hire somebody but um you know, the RFP is only one piece of the climate action plan. Mm -hmm. I know that there's been a lot of talk about how the climate action plan should be really a community-driven process. Mm -hmm. And so there could be work ahead of that that would um, strengthen the climate action plan process when the consultant comes on board or whoever comes on board to work it. So, and, and whether it's a consultant and how that's all going to work, there's going to be, you know, discussion, I'm sure, about that. But it doesn't have to wait till July 1, I guess, is the, right. the short answer. Yeah. We were talking it, about it as two streams, the climate action plan, but that's, you know, got some administrative time and then the community engagement time that really makes it a long process. So we can be doing things in the meantime. Um, so that's what we meant. And, and there doesn't have, to, I don't think there's any reason it has to be completed in one calendar year or anything like that. Not that, not that we want it to drag on, but. Right. Um, 
Um, but the thing is, I guess some questions came up because 50,000 probably won't be enough for the climate action plan. I think nobody thought it would be. Um, so we, you know, we're wondering about the ARPA process and the plans I looked at wherever I could find what their contracts were for. I put that in that resource sheet that you all got. So like uh, in Maine, Portland and South Portland did their plans together and they spent 220,000. Um, Concord Mass, which is a smaller city than Portsmouth, but similar in some ways because historic buildings and other things. Um, not to exceed 125 for that plan. So we'll put this on hold to. Hey, here. sorry, this is not normally uh, one interrupt. Somebody said you wanted to fly away. And oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're more happy to see you. Well, um, yeah, I am flying out right after this. There's apparently a storm coming tomorrow. Oh, yeah, I heard something about that. I, uh, I, I want to uh, rejoin my wife and family. Um, <laughs> But I uh, wanted to, to be here first to thank everyone um, for the work that is going on here and, and will go on. Um, I'm excited that uh, Josh is back on this committee after what he refers to as uh, sabbatical. Um, <laughs> and, um, but I'm, I'm truly excited about the work that's going on. So uh, I guess two points that I'd like to make uh, one, I want to envision these on Zoom and publicly noticed, um, not just for uh, letting the community know, but um, ease of, of meetings, but really this should be um, talking about engaging the community. And one thing out of COVID that we found was uh, the Zoom participation really did increase uh, people's participation in our government. Um, this is a big part. There's a lot of people that are excited about things that we can do um, to, to kind of bend the curve here in Portsmouth. So, you know, on the, 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 the most minuscule level is proper, properly noticing and putting the meetings on Zoom to make sure that everybody is able to participate uh, will go a step in that direction. The second part of what I want to share and my hope for this committee uh, going forward provided the CIP passes uh, as um, it currently has a climate action plan to really look to, to this uh, committee to help form that climate action plan and then hold us as a city accountable to meeting the needs uh, outlined and goals outlined in that climate action plan uh, is where I think um, this committee can take the ideas of the community, whittle them down uh, to actions that the city can take uh, and then measure those actions and hopefully get more people involved. So um, I'll take a few questions if there's any, but I also appreciate your time. I'm Larry LaRivie here. Hey, Larry. Um, I know your father. I know your, your brother. Okay. I know your aunt. <laughs> that gives you any idea sure. of how long I've lived in yeah. Portsmouth. Yeah, long enough. <laughs> um, What's the chances of making this a standing committee as opposed to a blue ribbon oh, committee? Oh, I think that would be, so one, I'm gonna look to uh, that lady right over there, Councilor Cook, um, but this was one of the, the committees that I do think should be uh, a standing committee. Um, there is, uh, we're a city on the sea, uh, whether we solve climate change or not, we're gonna feel the impacts for the rest of our lives uh, around that, um, so I don't see this committee ever going away. And I, I'd hope that out of the governance um, committee, there is a recommendation that this become a standing committee um, where uh, we can you know, have a, uh, I don't think any mayor would, would turn it down, but I, I do think that it, uh, when it become a standing committee, you, there's a certain amount of planning and foresight, um, especially from staff and involvement there. So. Um, I, I would hope that, you know, we have an audit committee, uh, so I hope that we can get the, through the, uh, the ordinances um, required to do that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect there to be pushback on the council level, uh, but I do want it crafted in the right way to get the engagement of the public because it's an opportunity to, to kind of bring that forward to, to the rest of Portsmouth. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Larry. 
Any other questions? Nothing? From the Eco Club? Eco Club? Anything? <laughs> no. No, um, I've been looking at a lot of other cities' climate action plans to prepare for our work. And um, a lot of cities look at it, there's what the city, the municipal government can do, but the much bigger piece is what the city could encourage and what citizens take on to do themselves. So I'm really glad to hear you talk about uh, community engagement. And by community, we also mean the business community. And I was looking at Burlington, Vermont, and they have a separate section for the airport. So they have kind of four buckets, the city, the citizens, businesses, and the airport. Mm -hmm. So it's just things to keep in mind. It's, I'm not saying that we have to do this. Well, but. Well, I think if we do it right, we account for one to two percent of total uh, kind of emissions of the entire city. That's not enough to bend the needle or bend the bend the curve, move the needle. I'm messing up metaphors there. Um, but what we can do is is lead and, and provide a uh, you know a, what an example of what good is um, and what great is. And so I, the city has that aspect, and then bringing the citizens and and helping them buy in the, the climate action plan itself and the CIP whether it's right now it's uh, fifty thousand dollars it, it could grow uh, if we need to see that in terms of how much it takes to actually write that you know look for input around this community in that process but that is somewhat minuscule uh, compared to the the cost of change um, over uh, you know when it comes to a departmental standpoint when it comes to say you know uh, uh, sidewalk or you know composting would be a citywide initiative things like that that's when mm -hmm. costs come in costs without engagement are, uh, are are tend to look at as as fees you know so we need to make sure that the cost through the tax uh, levy is something that we want um, and we, we will want it if it's correctly messaged and so I look at the folks in this room as um, the evangelists of a better future. Um, so it's a really important aspect. Um, and you know, we will do our best on the council. I know Councillor Cook and Councillor Denton um, are incredibly passionate about this. And I would say to a person, uh, we're engaged on the, the council level. But in order to actually get it across and get people coming out to CIP sessions, getting people to talk about tax rates, but then what we get for that, um, it's going to require people to, to buy in. Mm -hmm. When I lay in bed at night, and mm -hmm. Peter has been gone for two weeks, and we're here. <laughs> by You're your own place? I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've, uh, this is the biggest meeting I've seen of the, the count. We got uh, SRO. Mm -hmm. What's that? SRO, standing room only. Standing room only. And we have, uh, there's tremendous energy because there's tremendous need. Tremendous urgency because of a small time frame. So when I think how do this vast array <laughs> of years and, and experience and talent, what would it look like? I try to say in my mind, what would it look like if we had a climate action plan? What would it look the city look like if it was in your mind? Because you're in the thick of it, and we have other people. I see this as a little bit uh, of a dialogue. What do we vision? We can't go any place unless we can vision what we want for the city. And so I think when you're talking about permanent committee, you're thinking about community engagement. What, if anything, uh, is in your mind that you could? not this is as fixed, but start the dialogue for us to create that vision of what we can be to get where we want in the next five, 10 years, because that's a big, big, steep hill. It's a, it's a steep hill, but we're both optimists, right, Bert? Uh, no. No. Okay. I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you what, I've been in talking to people, and a lot of people are saying, uh, on a, on a one to 10 scale, they're at, at a five or a seven. I never used to be below five. The other day at gut level, I put up four. Okay. Because I'm getting information that's really serious. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not an optimist, but I, and I am hopeful. Okay, all right. Hope is different because we are here tonight because we know that we don't know. We don't know what the city should look like. We don't know what's going to come on board. We didn't know that you were going to inspire me, actually. <laughs> I've been thinking for years, and the first thing you said in the parking lot was you wanted the ordinances and a climate action plan. I said, what? <laughs> That's inspiring. <laughs> that, you didn't, you know, where did that come from? So I know that we don't know, and that's what I want to do is collectively get the vision that what makes me hopeful. Okay, well, uh, where it came from is talking to people in Portsmouth. So um, that's, a, uh, that's an easy one and should give you hope um, that it was coming from people in Portsmouth. I think there is a uh, more than, I can never remember, a groundswell uh, to, to take action. Um, and what uh, Portsmouth looks like, I don't, um, I can't say that I could paint right now a picture uh, of what it looks like. I do know that um, failures in politics, government, but politics are typically a failure of imagination, a failure to imagine a world that's different from today that we will all strive towards. I think a job of this community and, and this committee uh, is to define what that future looks like. I know there's some pieces. I see Lisa here um, from the school board. I see Eco Club. I would like this to be a interdepartmental inter aspect of how do we how do we push the idea of climate action into the community. So short term, if everybody understands a uh, climate action plan, what that actually means for Portsmouth, and then in two years, if everybody is agreeing that we definitely need a climate action plan. Those would be two very uh, short goals that I think that we could work on uh, as, as a committee. But bigger than that, I think that we have to imagine that it, it takes investment if we want a future that we're proud of. Um, investment of time, uh, investment of resources, um, an investment in our future. That's that's what I think a climate action plan spells out and steps in order to, to get there. And that's what I am hopeful about the energy in this room, the energy that I see when I talk to people, the energy that we hear either from urgency uh, or from opportunity, uh, there is energy. And sometimes they're hard to distinguish, uh, but they're both powerful in terms of motivation. and. There's not a single person that I've walked up to. You know, even Larry, the old Portsmouth people, there's not a single one of them that I've met that has said, you know, what's up with that climate action? Isn't that a bunch of hooey? Like, no, I, I think that people get it now. Uh, unfortunately, because we're so, our proximity to the effects are a little bit faster uh, and they'll be here a little bit sooner uh, than they are in the rest of New Hampshire and, and the rest of the state. I mean, I think, this is, I think this is for the whole group. We can discuss it after you leave, too. Is what <laughs> is, are you asking him what to leave? Is, <laughs> what is an, a, a climate action plan in your mind? If oh. you, yeah, what is in the climate action plan? Oh, right. Okay. So, what, what, what are we talking about? Yeah, so a climate action plan uh, to me is goals uh, and objectives across every department uh, in the city. Uh, to make sure that we are accountable uh, to reducing our impact uh, on the earth so that uh, we can enjoy it for a longer period of time. So whether it's the police department, whether it's the school department here in the municipal standpoint, you know, we still, you know, little things like the amount of paper that this, uh, that this city uses. It's not, I mean, luckily we're all on iPads uh, this year, um, but it's a, um, but to, to have key metrics and objectives across every department that we can actually say, this is where we're going to, this is where we want to get, this is where we are, and this is how we get there. That uh, is um, a climate action plan uh, for me and the, and the city of Portsmouth. And then ways of, to Effie's point, from a business standpoint, from a community standpoint, if the PDA will let us, you know, from an airport standpoint, you know, they're, 
Uh, there's a lot of development that's going on there. We only get one chance at development when it's, you know, we're talking about 200, 400,000 square feet, making sure that that's a part uh, of that as well. Um, so identifying areas that a climate action plan is needed and then identifying parameters of which a climate action plan uh, can be effective and, and measured. Yeah. This isn't necessarily a question for you, but I also want to kind of put what we're doing in a broader perspective because Portsmouth isn't alone in crafting a climate action plan. I was speaking with somebody from Clean Energy New Hampshire and Nashua, Concord, Keene, Hanover, and Lebanon are also creating climate action plans. And that could go to support our state creating a climate action plan as well because municipalities hold enormous sway over our state legislature. So it could have incredible ripple effects. Uh, and, oh, sorry, what was your name? Lauralee. Lauralee, that's right. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's right. Um, luckily, I imagine uh, climate action plans are kind of a leapfrog business where we can take the best of what's worked uh, in some other communities, see if it applies here, and then use that. And I like your idea of uh, using our our collective power as municipalities to push the state uh, to make um, climate action a, a part of the, uh, the states. I, I, I would like to believe that they all the time listen to us here at the municipal level. Um, <laughs> it's not always the case, but here's where, um, here's where it's really important. I've, uh, and people do things in Concord and it happens in Concord. Sometimes it trickles out to us down here in Portsmouth and Manchester, Nashua Keene. People don't really notice what goes on in Concord. Some do, some that pay attention. But people certainly notice uh, their tax bill or an ordinance that happens here on the local level. This is where we have community engagement. I would love to think that because we have 400 legislatures, uh, 400 reps up in Concord that everybody is as informed. That, not always the case, but people do pay attention on the community level. So I do agree that they might not listen to me as mayor or Josh uh, and Kate as, as the collective, as the council, but they do, they do listen uh, to people. And the people are gonna be most affected by what we do in this room in Portsmouth. And then we can take that uh, with other municipalities, with other people and say, this is the time for this is now. If we do not have this, you know, all of the industries that we built up around fail. Uh, you know, a couple of degrees, the foliage goes away. You know, fishing goes away. Uh, uh, tides come in and, 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 and wash us away and make it incredibly difficult to get storm water and wastewater out of here. So um, I, I like that. So I would add that to uh, the, the goals of a climate action plan in helping form uh, a blueprint for the rest of the state of New Hampshire to follow along with. I think that's a, I think Portsmouth's a, a few, it should be a few years ahead of the rest of the state. And so if we can act like that, you know, maybe we can be and, and bring them along. Sure. Thanks, Lori. Mm -hmm. Hi, John Kennedy. Um, Hi, John. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. I think I speak for all of us. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to collaborating uh, and kind of partnering through this whole thing. Um, I guess my question is, and similar to kind of what Bert was saying, um, you know, it's a little bit different. In your talks with uh, the folks around Portsmouth, do you think that there are other policy changes that can be implemented kind of concurrent with the Climate Action Plan? Because I think we're kind of putting a lot of eggs in that basket, right? And you never know what's gonna happen, and, and maybe that doesn't pass, or something gets delayed, or it takes a while, right? Like, you know, I know Josh has EV charging stations up there. Like, are there other things that we, as a kind of community, should be thinking about that we can work on, whether it's schools or businesses or airport that may be part of the climate action plan, but they could also live separate. And so we can start implementing change, whether or not the climate action plan happens this year or next year or in 10 years. So I'll, I'll take that question in, in two parts. First, um, I am confident that a climate action plan will happen. Um, and I am confident that the act of trying to get one passed has a purpose in and of itself of pushing and promoting ideas uh, out into the ether, which is Portsmouth, and having people 
think about them. So there's, there's the aspect of that. I think the climate action plan, we will find there's aspects of that climate action plan, be it uh, transit, uh, you know, EV charger is great, but you know, identifying like how coast could serve more people um, in Portsmouth from a standpoint of, mm -hmm. hey, if it didn't run every hour, would more people use it? How do we go about doing that? How do we go about funding that? Um, you know, from a zoning standpoint, you know, what uh, zoning is preventing more walkable communities outside the downtown? We get a lot of awards for being walkable in the downtown, but are we walkable in Panaway or, mm -hmm. you know, Elwyn Park? Um, so I view that the, the climate action plan is going to create a, a, a lot of different avenues for us to start, um, uh, start going down. What I think is gonna be the challenge is not necessarily getting a climate action plan built and across the line and us to identify. It's gonna be implementing the, the suggestions of the climate action plan. So I think that it is, it's a, it's a, it's gonna to be tough to make sure that we, we do the climate action plan well. I'm, I have a lot of confidence that we will make a good one. What I have less confidence about now, but that's only because it's earlier in the process and the, the, you know, the world is not uh, defined, is uh, how do we take those plans and put them into action? How do we say we want to increase uh, public transportation in Portsmouth? Um, what do we say when we want to uh, you know, have uh, greater density in uh, a part of town that hasn't had greater density before uh, to lower the, the footprint. How does that, how does that look? Those fights will be, uh, and not fights, but those will be harder to, to bring people along with. And so I, I don't view the climate action plan as a, um, you know, uh, I guess I don't view it as the eggs, I view it as the basket. And there's a bunch of different eggs in there, um, <laughs> all of which are gonna be, you know, hard to crack. And it's our job to, you know, collect up as many as we can, so that we have external optionality when it comes to trying to solve this in a, uh, you know, an incremental but fast way. Is that helpful? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. You all right. came all the way back around to the eggs. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> eggs. Listen, you know, I, I'm a man of many metaphors that sometimes <laughs> mixes them up. Um, but guys, I do have to run because I don't want to miss uh, my flight. Um, but it's. Uh, it's uh, it's it's great to see this this house packed for something that's not talking about um, you know it, it's easy to get things it's easy to get people out when um, when something is being taken away you know whether it's taxes and your money uh, uh, quality of life when it comes to your views corridors or things like that but you guys aren't here complaining about uh, what we're uh, what we're losing. You're here collaborating about you know what's possible for us to to gain as a city. That is incredibly powerful. Know that you are in a subset of people that devotes your time to something in the future uh, that is yet to be defined, um, because that's not common, and that should be celebrated. And I celebrate you guys uh, tonight, and I look forward to working with you uh, throughout these these next two years. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the invite, Bert. Thanks, man. Have a good Safe trip. travels. Safe. Yeah. Safe. Enjoy your vacation. Yeah. Welcome to the flight. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Safe yeah. travels. Yeah. Bye. Well, I don't control the flight. It's got to get there. So. <laughs> so. Well, as you all know, I'm in marketing and communications, and so Mayor McKenna <laughs> gave me an idea for a t shirt for this committee. The evangelist for a better <laughs> 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 Immediately wrote it down. No, that was I think we should make t-shirts. I said, I know a guy who oh, makes okay. t-shirts. We should make t-shirts. <laughs> <t -shirts. laughs> they have to be made out of um, recycled. Of course, all of that of recycled and completely Post sustainable. Bamboo. Organic ink and bamboo. all that good stuff. Um, no. <laughs> um, that, was, that was lovely. That was really good sentiments and good thoughts on certainly on the climate action plan so and I would like to just give him a note if he would have been here longer maybe two other items that I think we would have uh, will put on either our, our agenda tonight or next time is the uh, and it was building on the state idea the climate symposium mm -hmm. And I just need to say for myself, 
I don't see us needing or wanting to be the leader. I think the position that I would like to see us in is working together to facilitate everybody to move forward. And each person does that themselves. And I'd like to see us frame things in a cooperative model rather than the, the leadership model. It, it's, it's subtle, but I, I, I think it's important that if we're going to talk about community, we really need to uh, work in a model that says we're, we're, we're equals among equals and that we want to learn from each other, not to be the one who is teaching others. And that's why I also, I'm just going to use a little bit of trigger evangelism. Yeah. I, I don't, you know, these words make it No, different. I know. Yes, sorry. And, yes. and no, not sorry, because we all do it. And that's why I think we need to talk about it, mm -hmm. is I'm not out to change anybody. Mm -hmm. It's hard enough for me to change myself. Mm -hmm. It's hard enough for me to grasp the reality of what's happening myself. Mm -hmm. And so I want to keep the focus on each of us doing our own work and supporting each other mm -hmm. to do that. And that's a position that... that no, and it's such a good point, and I... Yeah, I tripped over it, but it's it's a, a we're communicators, communicators of a better better future, perhaps. So, I think there's a hand up. Yeah, I appreciate your points, Bert, and I agree with you entirely that you know for me community is so fundamentally important. But I will say, from what the mayor said, I I sort of thought of it more as leading by example and not so much as like dictating. Just trying to be thoughtful and thorough about how we develop and show what's possible so that if other communities are thinking about it, they can use us as an example of, oh, look what Portsmouth is trying to do here. Maybe we should try to do that as well. Not so much, you need to follow our plan. And community yeah. power is a lot like that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, li I like that getting me off my soapbox, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need is honesty and uh, that kind of, because that's true. Yeah. The best way we do is what our actions really say a lot. Mm -hmm. And if we as a community act in a, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciated your question too about, I think we all are maybe slightly thinking about the climate action plan, that definition just, just slightly differently, but mm -hmm. to be able to have what's that big vision. And I know we talked about this at the last meeting, but sometimes you need that big vision, that big overarching goal for the community to understand, for everybody to buy into it at their own level. And then a lot of the things that the city is A, already doing or putting forward, these are all kind of tactics and actions, EV charging stations, outdoor dining, composting, these all work towards in, this is in my mind that sort of bigger vision and whatever we come up with in our plan um, something else too that the mayor just said um, that struck me he said you know we're a seaside town and so for me I just had this all of a sudden I just thought this whole time I've been sort of thinking about the climate action plan is in the drawdown framework how we're drawing down our emissions and addressing greenhouse gases as each system, as a city, as businesses, the airport. Um, but I just wanted to make a plug too that we also need to be thinking about preparing for things that are already happening. Mm -hmm. So that sort of coastal resiliency preparedness mm -hmm. piece, I, I, I think there's like two, two mm -hmm. things we need to be doing as climate action plan, being, being prepared for the changes yeah. and then taking action to hopefully start towards drawdown. So mm -hmm. that was something I just, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wait a second, it's sort of need to be doing two things at the same mm -hmm. time. Does that make sense? Yeah. You might discover yeah. more things. As we more things, yeah. more, yeah. Yeah. more to add to the list. I guess. Well, and I feel like that's, from the city perspective, one of the biggest expenses is going to be around um, infrastructure improvements that are required because of sea level rise mm -hmm. um, and having to deal with stormwater um, having to deal with you know how do we how do we deal with pumping mm -hmm. we have water I mean because we we right now we have a plan for Prescott Park but Prescott Park is not the entirety of the parts of the city and streets that are going to be flooding so um, 
so a lot of the cost and I think that that's what the mayor's always talking about is this fifty thousand dollars is just a tiny bit of the cost for the city mm -hmm. but it puts us in line to be thinking about in planning for all those additional costs that we are going to be incurring mm -hmm. so something I would piggyback on that I think uh, another kind of two track that I think we should be considering is we've had a lot of talk tonight about community engagement which I think is very important both for you know um, raising awareness and getting ideas but I think it's equally as important to have a very strong expert factor to it which I guess is what the consultant is mm -hmm. um, because lots of people can have ideas about what they think is important like recycling comes up a lot and recycling of course very important I do it every day but that's not even close to the top line of what needs to happen as far as climate change you know I mean I think most people aren't even thinking about things like pumping stations for example um, so I think expert opinion needs to really factor in at least as much as community engagement does I, I, I'm, I'm just, just going to sure. clarify quickly with the $50,000 I always thought of that as seed money mm -hmm. I think when we originally talked about it it was 75 then it might have become 50 if I remember correctly and that was just the first step I mean I think it's going to be I mean, now we're finding out how, how much bigger it's going to get but I think I always thought of it as just a, a very first tentative step just to get that you know that consultancy and mm -hmm. I think we we should look much much further than that and, and from this point forward immediately mm -hmm. Sorry, Steve, yeah. Yeah, so just to, to tie a few things together I think um, like we've been talking about next steps um, and, and like Aubrey was saying we're gonna have experts that are gonna come in they're gonna sort of what they're going to need, I think, is you know some sort of direction. We're going to have to start thinking about specific goals, like like the mayor obviously alluded to, like our dates, timelines. Like, are we going to go just net zero? If so, by when? Are we using the you know the Paris Agreement sort of guidelines? Are we using other? Are we looking to other states to see what they're doing? Because states are all over the place in, in their goals. So we should start thinking about our concrete. Uh, goals and and timelines um, and the other thing that kind of made me think of is and this ties into the uh, greenhouse gas inventory that uh, counselor uh, wanted to start on an annual basis um, I've mentioned this before we've got initiatives kind of all over the place in the city um, would it be a good idea to just sort of pull them all together see where we're at right now make almost like a report card mm -hmm. just to have that mm -hmm. data available I mean that, that would tie in they're obviously gonna have to do another inventory mm -hmm. of greenhouse gases mm -hmm. anyway and just see where we're at with all our initiatives and, and put them in one place so we can really get a pretty good picture that way when they put that climate action plan together we could say okay here we are this is what we want this is where we are mm -hmm. and help us you know move forward mm -hmm. Yeah, Josh. I want to build off what was just said, but first, since this is recorded, make sure that you're talking into a microphone. Mm -hmm. It's um, cause if you're not like within a foot of the microphone, it's not going to be picked up on video, and people will stop watching the meetings. Um, with that said, the um, as far as what goals should the climate action plan be based on? I may be biased here, but since we do have a net zero energy policy, mm -hmm. I think we should start with that as the goals. And don't get me wrong, that needs to be adjusted. There weren't dates attached to it because there was little chance of the city council passing that policy if there were um, actual dates tied to it. So that was a concession. But I think the actual like phased approach that that took um, should be considered as goals and net zero energy was chosen instead of 100 percent because the way how new hampshire's is structured you can't technically get to 100 percent in new hampshire like you can in other states like vermont so we wanted to make sure it was realistic so we went with net zero energy but and the other thing i wanted to build off of i think the mayor talked about there are other areas that could also benefit from similar plans, whether it be the community, peas, 
one nice thing we were able to do for the uh, net zero energy policy is that committee got a member from Pease there to get some buy-in towards the policy itself. So I personally think the climate action plan should just be based on the city government, what um, it could do, but it could definitely set an example and we could try to encourage others um, in the community and Pease or whoever else we uh, partner with on a regular basis to do the same. Mm -hmm. Josh, would you define net zero as you understand it? So, I'm not a scientist, but to me, net zero is very simply that we use either the same amount of energy that we produce or less. And ideally, the energy would be produced in the community first before it was produced in the surrounding areas, then in the region. But it should be renewable energy that's being used as a priority. But again, it's using the same amount or less energy than what's being produced. Mm -hmm. yes, On an annualized basis. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just had a question. I just wanted to follow up with what you said, Josh. The, the, you said that you wanted the Climate Action Plan to be just the municipal government. So with Can you the just explain that? Because a lot of this talk has from the beginning has been about raising community awareness and outreach and action in the community, Correct. trying to tackle that so bigger nut. All of that are things that the government can be doing and they should be included, but the plan itself to me is, this is the plan for the government with just $50,000 seed money for the initial uh, RFP that goes out. I think it might be tough to say um, not just don't just tell us what you think the city could be doing, but also what can people that we can't control in the community do? Where, yes, we could give recommendations, but I think it'd be tough to actually bring them in the fold immediately. So would you consider changing building codes to make buildings more efficient part of the municipal government or not mm -hmm. under that definition? Yes, because it falls under the planning department. So that's something that we could do, we could change the codes, we could encourage people to build to a more stringent code, but it might be tough to go out and get developers to um, buy off and put their name with wet ink on the climate action plan itself. That's the distinction to me. I'm just going to go with Jess and then Steve and then Lisa. Oh, sorry, Kate, I didn't. That's okay. Well, I think, Josh, I have a similar question. Yes. Operate in a more sustainable way or so yes it would be a recycling program like I know there's composting on the board I'm not sure if that's the right example but having is that part of what you would consider a climate action plan is yes a climate action would include many things that the city could do to encourage the community to incentivize the community however it would be tough to require the community to right. do something. If you, if you, the city would make it easier or more accessible for citizens to choose to exactly. participate in those programs. Mm -hmm. Steve and oh, then Lisa yeah. and then John. John. Right. John? And Ben. And Ben, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to go back to Bert's question about the definition of uh, net zero, I knew I had this somewhere and just it, from the that city policy, I knew I had it quoted, so it's, I had it handy. It actually says, just says, the actual energy consumed on an annual basis is less than or equal to locally generated renewable energy. So that's how it's, that's just a quote from the actual policy that I happen to have handy. But there's another interesting document from the National uh, Renewable Energy Laboratory, which I will happily share the link to if anyone wants, about 20 pages and it talks about definition of net zero energy communities. So I'll, I'll put that out there. I'm not going to I'm not going to summarize that <laughs> for everyone, but um, that's all I got. Lisa, then John, then Ben. 
Sure. Well, I liked what Steve said about a report card, just because I think that we do have a lot of isolated programs that already could be used that are in place that maybe if we just republicize them in a way where we frame it as an, a chance for people to take climate action instead of just using the bike lanes or getting a charging station or composting, if we can try to promote it in some way, that might help to sort of kickstart a conversation. Um, and I guess I was also just curious if we've talked about, I know the historic district is one piece of it, but I do foresee potential tension around like if people want solar panels or charging stations or a lot of these things that we want to promote, where are we fitting that piece into it? And maybe that's already been discussed, but I was just curious. Oh, that's a great is that a zoning that. issue only or is that also a whole separate can of worms? <laughs> no, but it, it's a great point. Um, and one of the things that's also in the CIP budget is uh, I think 50, it's $50,000, I think, to revise the HGC guidelines as well. <laughs> so um, if this committee had a recommendation around things like solar or that they wanted to present um, to whatever committee makes those decisions, I don't know if it's going to be the land use committee, I don't know who, who's going to be doing that at that point. Um, it would be good for this committee then to move forward with a recommendation around that before those those um, guidelines are revised. And if so. I could build off that before you go, Ben. So the Steve mentioned the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. They put a study forward almost a decade ago on their view of best practices of implementing solar in any HDC. One of the takeaways, and again, I'm not a scientist, but it was encourage buildings to first be sealed before you put solar on it because you could throw solar on a roof sure it looks great you feel like you're doing something good but it's significantly more beneficial when it comes to energy consumption just to tighten the building all around so it goes through things like that um it does have some suggestions on where solar could be located on roofs it makes recommendations that solar shingles are better than solar panels I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, however, the only time I spoke at an HDC meeting as an elected official was when I first got elected. I went to the HDC, uh, brought that with me, and asked them to consider it. And um, uh, the new planning director, I sent that to her because it came up at the city council's retreat. I also sent it to both the mayor, who asked the very same question, mm -hmm. and um, Councillor Rich Blaylock, who is the HDC rep. So they all have that and whether there's a new version of it or something better i'm not sure but that's a good uh Gosh, starting what point what was the name of the organization that enroll it's the national renewable energy laboratory thank you ben, did you have this comment? this might be redundant so stop me if it's if if i'm just talking in circles but the thing i i that comes to mind that i envision when we're talking about a climate action plan um facilitating uh, sustainable practices among citizens and encouraging them and incentivizing them this the skeptical side the, the skeptical <laughs> voice inside me says that there are people and there are parts of every population that you can incentivize and encourage as much as you want and there's always somebody who objects or who doesn't buy in or who doesn't you know, care for lack of a better word so like the, the model in my mind, the perfect utopian climate action plan city, I go to Cup of Joe's, not a, not a promotion by the way, no affiliations, <laughs> just for the record, no, no, no affiliations, yeah. uh, but I go, I get a hibiscus iced tea and it comes in a cup <laughs> and I'm walking around downtown and I can put the cup in a receptacle just as easily that, that I can compost. It's a compostable or recycled. It's mm -hmm. just as easy for me, and it, it doesn't change my lifestyle. That's where I see the buy-in. Mm -hmm. So I think we've already discussed like the holistic approach and how it has to be every step of the way. But we can say all day long until we're blue in the face, oh, you have to compost. You have to take this to the recycling. You have to, you know, and people still will, will never have that that complete uptake as, as I see it. So I think the focus should be for us to build build this all in, as one kind of unit so that 
people's lifestyles don't have to change and adapt to whatever we get out of this climate action plan, but that the city kind of behind the scenes or on the, on the back side of that, the city becomes sustainable, it, it achieves net zero without the citizens having to actually do, you know, without, without the perception of, of, of inconvenience or of a great change. That's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. That might be redundant, that might be pointless, but I, I thought it was, it just, it just came to mind and I wanted to. Mm -hmm. I think the flip side of that is also just not making it challenging for people mm -hmm. who are your early adopters to do the progressive things that they want to do. Mm -hmm. And so whatever we can do to publicize like lower fees, lower paperwork, <laughs> and make it easier for people to be incentivized to do the things they want to do anyway, yep. and not make it a million meetings and <laughs> a lot of hassle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I could add one thing to something that you said earlier, Lisa, you mentioned how having a report card and maybe sharing it in advance with, in the RFP itself. Yeah, I think that was Steve's idea, but yeah. That may be idea. Idea. <laughs> one of the city's annual documents, um, it's, I can only remember which one it was. I don't think it's the actual budget, but if you flip through, it has icons next to it, which says, mm -hmm. you know, this falls in that category. So something like that already exists, and I'm not sure who in staff would be the planning department who we could ask, like, hey, um, could you finance. pull out a finance? They yeah, create the document. Is that the one? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. If they could pull out everything that has those icons on it already, so it could be shared as part of the RFP, because we don't need to recreate the wheel, mm -hmm. kind of like the net zero energy policy as a goal, it simply exists. Yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot that exists, and I think that's, that's a really good Capper. point. And I, I was thinking about your renewable energy policy also as a starting point to include, so we capture all that first. And usually in an RFP, you have a list of, of documents, so you give that in the RFP out to people and see what they bring back and, and how you get that. And, and one of the things about the RFP, too, is it could be informative you know, there might be different things in different RFPs that we like. It doesn't have to be that we select the first person we like. We might want to get them to team up with other people or do different things. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ways to go. But I think the, t the more we talk about how we're going to get move forward in the city, the better. Okay. I guess as um, even time, I'm just being mindful. We've got till like 8:30, correct? Wow. Um, I guess I'm I'm still not. And maybe because it's just the end of a long week, and I'm sorry. Um, I'm still not clear from this committee if there are things that we want to do for community engagement, this putting out this report card, um, letting the, the community and the residents know what we're already doing from a sustainability initiative standpoint. All that being said, are, are there things that we want to do in parallel track to releasing this RFP to sort of um, can't think of the I can't think of the right metaphor, but so two tracks, so two tracks <laughs> going at the same time. Yeah. Um, so we're if doing that's the climate that action plan, and we're doing the energy, and we're doing the recycling, and re so they're both going on. They're not either or. They're both. They're at. both. Is yeah. that what you're asking? But I don't know if I'm not I'm not getting clarity. I'm sorry oh. from the committee if that's something that we want to do or we want to just say draft this RFP and and release it, you know, sometime before June. I, I would think that one of the priorities for the committee is to help define a scope of work for the RFP mm -hmm. so that we offer some guidance to the city manager um, and to Peter <laughs> so that so that um, basically what the committee wants in a climate action plan that mm -hmm. kind of guidance yep. um, so that they can write the RFP but at the same time then after you have them initiating that process, then the committee could have, like the mayor suggested, community meetings, you know, where you gather um, prior to selecting anyone to, to prepare the plan, have community meetings where you gather information mm -hmm. from the community. So you could have this process started, um, but you'd have to issue, you need to issue the RFP so that you can, I think usually depends the bidding time, you know, you can correct me, I don't know how long it would be on a climate action plan, usually 30 to 60 days. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Kate. Yeah. And do John and then Bert, is that all right? I think another interesting 
element here is, I think Kate touched on it last meeting, was, you know, part of this climate plan, and, and the mayor also spoke about it, right, like, there's going to have to be costs associated with it, right? Like, there's it, there's goodness there, but we might get some pushback. And, you know, this goes with, I think is what was some of the original charter of the committee is to kind of poke and prod and find projects that are ultimately, you know, cost savings, right? And so there's the the street lights that went a couple of years ago and that saved on a hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever it is right like that's a good thing right so there's a cost outlay but then every subsequent year it falls right so if we are going to try to uh you know combat those little hurdles and battles like should this committee have a point of view and saying hey listen like we know that uh you know the budget's going to go up but we also think that we can save five hundred thousand dollars if we do this thing right mm -hmm. like and so to me that is interesting um and potentially something that we might want to pursue to kind of help find potential funds or not have as much objections. Mm -hmm. I think Kate hit on a point that's been on my mind. Uh, I, I had about an hour conversation with the consultant who writes RFPs. And I'm trying to get that process in my mind. And so when Kate said, Peter's probably going to be the one it was, is this going to fall on your shoulder, shoulders pretty much? Yeah, well, with you guys, I'll, uh, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> that's, so it's falling on your shoulders. So as you are thinking about getting this done and doing it well, what, if anything, is in your mind that we haven't done or already done that could be helpful to you? How could we be of service to well, your getting that done so you could get to bed at a reasonable hour. I think the mayor touched on it too, but it's there's a, this is not reinventing the wheel. There's climate action plans all over the country in different sized communities and different and and it's not like we want to go take South Portland's plan or Portland's plan. Every city is different. So we know you guys know Portsmouth and we kind of know what we want. But I think to Kate's point, the list of things we want to include in there would be um, really important so the either their their objectives of the climate action plan what do we hope to get out of it it's only fifty thousand dollars so it's not it's not the whole world but um to me just looking at some of those other plans out there and seeing what resonates with what this committee has been talking about those key points that we want to make sure we include i think that that's what i'm going to do that's how i do other rfps you look at the last ones that were done or other communities that do them or that kind of thing and try to make it a better project rather than trying to start from scratch. And um, anything along those lines, if you look at those, and then think about what we can do. I'm still struggling with the outreach, and you know, there's, and John's idea that the city could do something that could save $500,000, but the community could do something that could save $5 million, you know? So what things in the community should we be asking people to do that are gonna be moving us in the right direction, that those kind of big community things are what I think is this plan is really going to be stronger for if we can get there. And I, I, I don't think we shouldn't, shouldn't tell the government what to do, but I do think we need, and we haven't really in the past, and we can't necessarily make people do things as we've seen before. State law has to be there for it, mm -hmm. but we can encourage people and we can show by example what can be done. So I don't know, that's a long way around to say, you know, what can what can you see that other communities have done that would be really cool in Portsmouth and be effective and get us where we want to go? Mm -hmm. Here goes John. John, sorry, I've got my back to you, so You're, I can't no see worries. And then Aubrey, did you? No, I was just okay. pointing out that <laughs> he was waving his hand and you he probably couldn't see him. John, <laughs> John. <laughs> sorry, which, which John first? Uh, we'll do John Kennedy and then. And then the John, other John and Kennedy. The other Really? Yeah. Really? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Confusing. All right. But my, my middle name, my mother's maiden name. Um, I think there's a lot of good ideas like piggybacking off this, right? Like Josh originally, or a couple minutes ago, said that, you know, we get kind of more bang for our buck if everyone kind of better insulates their houses, right? And, like, are we ultimately better served if somehow there's a way for Portsmouth to, like, really take New Hampshire Saves, which is an existing program, right? And, like, somehow just make sure that everyone's aware, and I don't know how we do it, like, maybe it's a library event or something. But if we can get, you know, 10% of ports with houses to retrofit and put better insulation, like, that's a really big win. It saves the residents money, and it ultimately saves on energy, right? So are there things like that that are kind of already out there we just need to kind of better partner with, you know, some of these organizations? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Josh. John, well, okay. Well, 
Um, so yeah, I just wanted to actually call out a resource. We've talked about um, learning what's, you know, no, not reinventing the wheel, learning from what other municipal municipalities have done, particularly in New Hampshire, um, what goes on in Concord and how we make sure our voices are heard there. So Laurel, I mentioned uh, an organization called Clean Energy New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. um, I've been at this for about a year and a half as a semi-retired person. I joined CNH last year, and I just found them to be a tremendous resource of information, uh, they're not for profits, so they're not in the consulting business, but they pull together uh, municipalities and businesses and individuals like me. They've got caps. They could help us talk in more detail to items four, five, and six. So I just wanted to, to shout them out. They're a local organization. They've been at this for about 15 years. And very smart, no pun intended, but very high energy mm -hmm. people. And I, I think they can help us, and they're, they're available to help. Mm -hmm. It's called Clean Energy New Hampshire. Thank you. Yes, sir. The um, meeting on sustainability at the library last night re uh, showed uh, Paul Hawkins' talk about drawdown. Mm -hmm. And there was an interesting part where he said, that 70% of all the greenhouse gases are coming from uh, energy. He said, however, if we completely eliminated all fossil fuel energy, we're still going off the charts in terms of climate change. Those of us who were there last night, I don't know if anybody remembers that. Did I get that correct? Yeah. So. What he was saying was, energy is incredibly important. However, this is why I'm really interested in what the goal of the Climate Action Plan is. Because if the goal is to get us to completely neutral energy use, but agriculture is going, consumption is going, uh, people, uh, social justice isn't here. Uh, I mean, there's a multitude of things that need to happen. And that's why I, I felt badly about saying I'm not an optimist. I am hopeful because I'm going to give everything I have to make something happen. But given the trends of where we're going in the world, in the social context, in countries cooperating together, we are going to be having to keep our eye on five to 10 years to be at a certain place with reducing, drawing down greenhouse gases. And I'm going to just put out some of the things that concern me. The Amazon forest is now not a sink any longer. It is a emitter. That's a huge perturbation in the system. I think we need to take that in. It's not, a, it's not making me optimistic. And that has political ramifications. The melting permafrost and the forests in Alaska are really uh, releasing methane, which is a huge contributor. So taking in the reality, I'm also taking in that Denmark has wind power model in place that says if we can take that model there is 13 times more wind power energy than is needed by all of the world today. So I hear both of those things coming at me at the same time. So I guess, I, I, John, I, just to let you know, John has a center. So here's, here's where I'm saying that this committee would do well to look at what is the real goal 
and I'm sure other people have thought about this, what is the real goal of a climate action plan? And if we are effective, and everybody else is effective in doing it, that we're going to really get somewhere. And I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's really worth our attention. And then mm -hmm. I saw John had his hand up, but I don't know. John, Aubrey, and Kate, did you have something? Thank you. Yeah, just real quick, but on, on the uh, resource stuff, you just held up one of my favorite authors on this topic. One of the others is John Durr, uh, Kleiner Perkins, John Durr. So he put together a book called Speed and Scale, and the two of them together are sort of the opposite ways of looking at your question. Most people, including those two, will agree that a, a cap is not meant to go to do just energy. Exactly right. If all we did was solve energy, we haven't, we haven't stopped the curve. There's a wonderful cheat sheet. I've actually got a printed version of it that, that uh, came with Durr's book. See this book. But so they, it lists nine or 10 things that are climate relevant. Power is one, food is one, food waste is one, and each of them actually has um, KPIs attached to it. That's how Durr thinks, because that's what he does. Um, but again, if anyone's interested, John Durr, Speed and Scale, and anything by Paul Hawkins. Mm -hmm. We can literally lift out of that the things that any municipality or, frankly, any business could include in its own cap. Mm -hmm. yeah. Aubrey and then Kate, I think. Right. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that I, I think what you're saying, Bert, is very, very important for context. Um, but I also feel that we're a small community in a small city. We're not going to do anything about the Amazon directly. We're not going to do anything about the melting tundra directly. And we have almost no agriculture, so we can't really affect that. I think that as a committee, we really need to focus on the things that we can put our hands on and control. Like an example that John gave, we don't have control of the food side, but we do have control of the food waste side, or at least somewhat. Mm -hmm. So like composting and that type of thing is something that we can do. And I, I, I just feel that with limited time and resources, we really have to focus on the things that we can actually affect change on at a local level. Mm -hmm. I just want to respond to that. I, I feel we do want to be practical. However, the rainforest is being destroyed because of part of the agricultural processes which our community is using uh, when you start. To, you could, we're all interconnected, so it's just like uh, when the city does something, it's going to affect the community. I think if we take the top scale, I actually think that uh, when they say 30% of the carbon going up is due to food, every single person in the community every day makes a decision about their food. And what we can do is connect our everyday habits, empower ourselves, and it is affecting the Amazon. Yeah. And so that's, so I'm, I'm not saying it's an either or, and I, and I know that most of us get mad or motivated, myself included, about things that are actually doing here. But I think that our job is to connect us to the bigger system so that we are aware that we're not alone. We are actually, you know, the old, the butterfly in <laughs> Japan. So I'm, anyway, thank you. <laughs> Kate, yeah, I think I mean, this is a very important discussion to be having because I think that, that that delineates the difference between what our what our scope of work is for a climate action plan versus our scope of work for community education, which I think are, are two elements here that are critical to address. You know, we I think the scope of work for a climate action plan should be comprehensive. You know, yes, we should start with a net zero energy policy because we have one in place, but that's one policy we hope for a future of many policies, right? We want to potentially have curbside composting. You know, we would like to see um, more EV, sta EV stations for charging. We want to see, you know, more solar panels on homes, even in the historic district. You know, I'd love to see the Trees and Greenery Committee have some rules around cutting down trees, you know, for the city and policies about replacement of trees. I mean, and even for residents, some guidance around that as well. You know, so, so all of these, 
I, I would see this as a comprehensive plan. You know, those are just a few of the things that would be incorporated in it that would provide the city with guidelines for how we initiate new ordinances for residents, how we initiate new programs for residents, and how we, how the city itself provides guidance and education. But then there's this other element of this group providing continued public education, public input, having large meetings around a climate action plan and large discussions, getting the business community on board with thinking about what is their action plan as a community. You know, maybe you involve the Chamber of Commerce and the business community. Maybe then you also invite Peace, Peace Development Authority to, to take part in our discussions and ask them to develop their own plan as well around that because the city has limited impact there. There are things though that we can do as a city with regard to peace. So, so to me, it's, it's kind of these two things working in conjunction with each other. I, I think um, I by look, <laughs> looking at other cities' climate action plans, we'll get some ideas what we want for our overarching goal and then how we accomplish it. But I wanted to mention that um, there's a model that cities use for um, motivating businesses and households to be more sustainable. I, I think it's in California. The last one I looked at is Albany, California, and they have sustainable households, and they're looking to get, I don't know, 300, and they only have half of them. You know, they haven't uh, gotten the interest and the commitment, but they have a menu of things that households could do, kind of looking at the drawdown principles, like um, having more uh, plant-based meals, um, driving to work less frequently, you know, things like that, or not using the dryer at home, using a clothesline, you know. And people commit to them for their household and then they become a sustainable Albany household or something. And they have a parallel kind of program for businesses and different plans. And I think that's how the city would be involved, just in, in setting something up and, and we as a committee would play a role in that. Um, I also wanted to talk about financing, what the mayor was talking about. Once we have a plan, you know, there's multiple things we have to play, pay for, and a lot of them are infrastructure and capital type expenditures. But there's this really great document that's in the resource sheet you got. It's from the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. And this is just yeah. Bend Oregon's financing <laughs> plan. But the point is they have public-private partnerships, they have uh, loans, they have grants, they have a revolving load fund. There's all different kinds of, you know, partnerships, funding, financing um, for all these different projects. So that was just something to keep in mind. It doesn't all come out of the city coffers. And savings, the point that John made, I think, or Steve made, is important um, part of that. Um, and another thing I happened to pick up um, UNH has at their law school, Franklin Pierce Law School, has 50 students working <laughs> full-time pro bono in the summer for government mm. agencies. So if we could put somebody on looking at all the zoning and land use ordinances and the best, uh, in terms of climate, the model uh, ordinances that some, some are out there and putting that all together in some massive document <laughs> for the city, I think it'd be worthwhile, and I don't know who would initiate something like this. You know, it's only a, two lines in the UNH magazine, but, I see that. Um, but I'd love to have someone with that kind of expertise and time to dig in, and maybe there's something else we should be having a pro bono law student looking at, um, but hearing the mayor talk and Kate mention some things and other people talking about HDC, it seems like a good fit. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it. Okay. I, can I just note that the, there's a land use committee right now meeting trying to make changes to land use ordinances. So this is another one of those like, if you can get them information sooner rather than later. Okay. Yeah. And, but it's the land use committee, so is there one person to reach? Is it the planning director? No, it's, it's a, a committee of the city council. So it's a subcommittee, okay. essentially, and they're they're meeting and discussing changes to land use um, 
provisions to our zoning, but it but they're focused around affordable housing. So just know they're focused around affordable housing issues and uh, and making sure our land use and zoning rules encourage that. Um, but and making any changes that, that we feel like needed to be made. So they're gonna come back with recommendations. I don't know, um, I don't know when they would look at this, but it would be something that they could look at. Yeah. Yeah. And who's in, in charge of that committee? Jane? Beth Morrell. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm just looking at our time. Um, if we could just spend the last half, we've got half an hour, um, mm -hmm. and see if we can just move on to the EV charging stations, which I think Josh will take the lead on discussing that. But I just wanted to throw out one yeah. idea to wrap up the cap because it seems like if this is a focus for our committee, which I think it actually should be, and we've got some parallel steps to be taking as far as community engagement and the RFP process and the scope of work for that, is it worthwhile to set up, I, I can't remember who pitched this idea of setting up almost a subcommittee for the cap process or if we should just keep on. I think a subcommittee makes sense. To make sure it. Yeah. Where they could work outside of this committee and report back mm -hmm. versus um, everyone. Everyone would still have input, but it would be the primary focus of those people outside to work on it. Like I guess I'm just curious as to what that, how that would be different than sort of the conversation we're having here. And or maybe if, if there's on. a couple people on this committee that sort of want to take, they, Effie took the lead in, in kind of honing in and, and pulling all these resources together, looking at different RFPs, if it would be helpful, you know, to you, Peter, to maybe just have a couple of people that between us meeting monthly kind of keep pushing this, this action item forward. I guess, I guess I'm, I, I hate to lose the, the mind of the committee mind. and almost feel like a short section. If maybe that subcommittee could focus this committee, but I, I guess no, just that's bringing, why I'm throwing a, bringing it back a there. result from a subcommittee to me from a small group of this bigger group that has a more diverse, I don't know, just okay. another perspective. Okay. I don't think, I don't think the two are exclusive. They both could happen. Yep. But okay. I don't, I, I guess I wouldn't want to see it happen at the, at the loss of being able to have this conversation with the big Absolutely. committee. Mm -hmm. Could a subcommittee potentially meet just between now and the next meeting and come back with just more information about and recommendations so that then this committee could talk about those? And I'm concerned about time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm concerned about getting information to the city as soon as possible so that they can develop an RFP because the RFP process could be, you know, 30 to 60 days anyway. And so then you're still looking at, you know, pushing it out to May, June, July, mm -hmm. just like being careful. Between, yeah. let's say, Kate, between um, this meeting and next meeting, if our action item is to develop this draft scope of work just for the RFP, I think that'll require, you know, maybe, maybe a subcommittee is too official, but maybe just appointing two people to, to make sure that happens and, and work on it with, with Peter. And as a Blue Ribbon Committee, I, don't think a, I do not think there are any rules prohibiting that, mm -hmm. versus if it was a standing committee, there would actually be rules. Mm -hmm. So I think it pretty much comes down to who has the time and wants to help on this, whether it's via email, whether it's um, meeting in a coffee shop somewhere, mm -hmm. just to keep the ball rolling outside of here. It doesn't have to be anything formal, because this isn't really a formal mm -hmm. committee. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one thing is March 7th is the okay, Larry CIP just, vote. He just, Sorry. No, he, no, he, are you, uh, you're putting your hand up to be on yeah. the, the drafting of that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> one thing I haven't heard a word of tonight with this CAP is anything to do with the, our water, water runoff, mm -hmm. protection from flooding, and, and that sort of thing. And that's got to be, I think, that's got to be a part of it because what's outside our door right here? Now, you, you don't have to be a novice living in the city to see that there is a lot of water uh, flooding potential here. And I just happened to have seen a PBS program this week 
um, that showed about the floodgates that are down in Louisiana to protect that state from the same sort of thing that happened during Katrina, that when they have an issue, they close the floodgates. Well, that didn't come at the drop of a hat. It's something that's been in planning for, for some time. And I think that it needs to be a part of what we're talking about here in some capacity. And I know that Pete has been working on that uh, for the city, uh, devising a system that protects us. Um, but I don't think it's the only thing that we can talk about is what has been done. It's, you know, I see the South Mill Pond as a disposal, if you will. I go, I walk around that, and I see those drains spewing out water from runoff. Well, from where? I don't know. But they claim they've got everything under control. The city does. Uh, but if I see water coming out and it's not clean water, then what are we doing? We're polluting downstream. Everything is going out that way. So... Well, it's a lot cleaner than when you were younger, Larry. I'll tell you that. It's a lot cleaner. A lot cleaner. Than Very few CSOs compared to what there is now. <laughs> but it's not perfect. No, we're an old city, but we can work at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that preparedness piece is a huge part of the climate action plan. So I think Effie, Effie, then Bert, and then we must, we definitely <laughs> should move on to EV. Sorry, Josh. Oh, no, yeah. I think so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to mention March 7th is the capital improvement plan vote. And I'm not going to be here, but if we want anyone speaking in support of the climate action plan. I, I went to the work session, which seems like a long time ago now, but. I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, I went to the work session. Oh, yeah. Some right. time ago now, and I think it'll, I don't think it'll need much of a push. No, but not. But speaking in favor helps both yourself and Christina spoke, and maybe only five total people spoke at the last city council meeting total at the CIP. And especially when you spoke, Ben, at the work session, that carried a lot of weight for the councilors because anytime the youth gets involved. So anyone who could attend, preferably in person over Zoom, but Zoom's an option, and there's still a ongoing public hearing so you could speak for as long as you'd like although we ask you to keep it under three minutes <laughs> so if you can make it on February sorry March 7th uh, the meeting should start at 7 and the public hearing should be at the very beginning uh, please do and just mm -hmm. voice your support for it uh, I just comment? wanted to get closure uh, Effie has put a lot of work in already, so I don't know if there's more, but was there anybody who wanted to meet Effie or anybody else just to, to, to look into things and, and bring them back to help move things along? And we, we did, and so well, there is. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll okay. see what I can do. Looking. Yeah, so yeah. there's, and, and John, so there's people who, uh, the more energy we put together and just bring it back, that'd be really great. And uh, Effie, you've been kind of, are you willing to bring it together? Did you get everybody's name or? Um, I'm happy to work on it. I will be in Puerto Rico <laughs> most of the time <laughs> we're talking about. Um, so I think I'd rather not leave it. Um, Would one of you be willing to call people together? One of the four, that's. Sure. Okay, John, John will get everybody's name. You'll set out some times and then you can bring it back. Thanks, John. And, and Effie, if you could share with John the documents you already have, yes. and then send it out. That'd be good. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, Josh, for sure, for sure. Sure. So, <laughs> Steve, I don't know if you want to go with the EV charging stations. You asked to be up, or I could gladly give it one over the world and where it you know, stands. Uh, you, you go. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, big picture for those who don't know, uh, there's three types of electric vehicle charging stations out there. There's level one. My understanding is you kind of just plug your car to the wall socket, and it might take 
12 to 20 hours to charge. There's level two, which is the standard chargers. Uh, there are several around town, including public ones, like the lower lot there. The Hanover Garage has uh, one, which means two ports, and then the new garage has five charging stations in it. And then there's, those might take eight to 12 hours to charge, and then there's level three, 480 volt chargers, which could charge a vehicle in about 30 minutes. Um, they are quite popular for EV enthusiasts because you'd much rather be able to park your place, your vehicle for 30 minutes and charge it versus all night. And there's a big push in the Biden administration to roll them out. The um, bipartisan infrastructure law has a lot of money in it that could be used for things like this. There are some limitations where they have to be close to the highway. Same thing with um, uh, Volkswagen got a lot of hot water years ago. Their diesel vehicles, um, they were lying about the emissions, which ended up in a lawsuit. And then there's money out there for this right now. So that's big picture. Um, for several years, I tried getting a uh, DC fast charger, so level three downtown in the capital improvement plan. Uh, I was successful. It initially I wanted it in Market Square. Um, what I learned is it's you want charging stations where they're publicly visible, not tucked away. And I got some pushback from then the mayor and city manager said, hey, let's do the Bridge Street lot instead. And that's where the pop up was two years ago. So the one across from where the Whalen Wall used to be. So I'm going to be dating myself with that. Mm -hmm. The um, and I had push to include it. Or I asked for a report back on how we could fund a EV charging, uh, DC fast charger downtown. Um, the report back came with uh, a couple things of note. Um, so one charging station with two ports would likely cost $130,000. And that doesn't come with the 480 volt um, electricity pack. I'll simply call it that, which is likely around $20,000 from Eversource. So probably close to $150,000. Um, I would love to see it. I don't know if there's electricity capacity for it downtown right now. Um, likewise, it could be a hard sell on the public. But one thing which the report back did say is it would make more sense in their view to do uh, level two charging stations downtown uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, well, I'm saying downtown, I'm talking about the um, there's different parking zones, so the prime places downtown to park. Uh, they recommended level two charging stations there instead. They are less expensive for probably about half the cost, and you don't need um, a 480 volt booster. Uh, you could get probably three chargers, so six actual ports. Um, there wasn't any specific places recommended, but they said that would make more sense. And their logic was the opposite logic of what I had previously heard, which is you want a DC fast charger in a, um, by a convenience store or by a coffee shop or um, the library where people stop for a short period of time versus downtown. Uh, my counter argument's always been, well, there's 15 minute parking and then there's three hour parking. Um, with all of that said, and with the city's stated preference being level two chargers uh, downtown at this moment, um, I just want to see what everyone's thought would be instead of me pushing to include a level three DC fast charger downtown, uh, possibly pushing like, all right, well, let's do some level two chargers at street level parking downtown. And the best time to do anything like this is when there's actually work already being done. Um, Market Square is getting ready to be torn up. Um, that's where I originally wanted the DC fast charger. Likewise, Fleet Street's gonna be mm -hmm. torn up. So um, I could make that proposal for that instead. But I want to throw that out there and get everyone's thoughts on. I, a, I just yeah. had a question about the, the fast charger. How many pl plugs are you talking about? In so that? for a DC fast charger, so one station is two plugs. Mm -hmm. Two plugs. Mm -hmm. So that would be around $150,000 if the electricity exists. And I think Ben. Ben. So I, I drive a Chevy Volt. Nice. So I have the electric car ownership insight, which may be, you know, it's a little bit different because I do have a small amount of gas, but the principle is the same. So I know I leave the house, I have a charger at my house, I leave with a full battery in the morning. Usually that's enough for my daily driving. 
There are a couple places, Portsmouth, uh, the Hanover Garage being one of them. The Newmarket Public Library has one free level two charger. Um, and I think, oh, that's fantastic. But unless I desperately need electricity, if I'm not going to be leaving the car for five, six hours, I think, okay, what's the point? I'll just park anywhere else. So if we're going to be having level two chargers, they should, I think, and I think you touched on this, they should be in places where people are leaving their cars for, for very long periods of time because otherwise, if Market Square is covered in level two chargers, the way I see it, no one's going to use them. No one's going to say, okay, let me get my, let me get my card or my app out and, you know, sign in and pay and then a lot of the time it's just easier to, to skip it and go home and charge at home if you have a charger at home whereas the level three I think there's a lot of logistical challenges so I think we would be pinpointing them to where they are most acutely needed because they are so expensive and, and so infrastructurally uh, demanding and I, I think those if, if, if we instead of doing say 10 level two chargers I think two or three stations of a really high speed, all right, I'm going in to grab a coffee, 15 minutes, I want 75% battery capacity. I see people using that and utilizing that much more frequently. And I think it's like a mental barrier almost of, it's so much easier. And I that was my that. original mindset when I was yeah. pushing for it. So I think, I think the original concept is, is a strong one. Mm -hmm. Aubrey? Um, I, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, one, as far as 480, can we get, because I know they don't have 480 power everywhere. Is that, that something that we could talk to like Eversource and get a map of where they actually have 480 lines in the city I to start with? I believe they could, and the reason why, the, the report that came back said the Bridge Street lot would again be the most likely place is because of the electricity there's I don't want to say a shortage of electricity but with a lot of construction going on downtown um, there might not be the 480 volts required right um, right in Market Square or Fleet Street. yeah um, just I think from what my understanding it's somewhere on Hanover Street they'd have to come from and they'd have to go across the street so you would have to dig up the street and get your transformer set your transformer over there okay, so that's um, there's power issues with this I mean if you're looking to put it anywhere there's going to be power issues all over town a lot of our facilities don't have the capacity just straight up do not have the capacity for that um, I, I have a lot of concerns about this um, I approach it from sort of maybe a different angle um, I know hearing from people I work with who've dealt with power issues in all the facilities <clears throat> that we don't have the capacity for some of these chargers uh even the level two ones because they didn't provide enough space on the service for future growth which they should have um in my view i feel like if you if you're just joe schmo taxpayer or whatever you want and you want to believe you believe in charging you want to build out the infrastructure you want to you want to get these in as many places as possible i personally like the level two just because you can get the most bang for your buck. Um, things I've heard from from people around, uh, they say, okay, we, you might have a DC fast charger there, and why should I be charging for free, this, or for small free or whatever, this person to put up 300 miles of charge so they can what, drive back to New York? No, you want them to get into town and you get them up enough charge so they can get back to where they came from and they stay a couple hours and they spend some money downtown i think it's an easier sell and i think you when you get that more for your money you, you know you, you're building out that infrastructure a lot more so that's kind of the way i approach it um so that's just a couple of thoughts i mean i have a thousand thoughts those are just the ones <laughs> on, on the top of my head yeah Effie and then john thanks sorry aubrey I'll be quick. <laughs> I have an electric car and I would love for there to be a supercharger mm -hmm. or you know fast yeah. charger yeah. near Portsmouth whether it's in Portsmouth or not we have to go to Seabrook, Seabrook's the closest Portland one. or Concord for a fast charger it's ridiculous and a level two just it takes a long time um, we use a trickle charge the low level charge most of the time you know if we're just gonna be driving around town 
but um, if you if we had a, a fast charger it would bring people in too. people that are traveling would stop to charge their car and get their coffee and do whatever um, but I, I don't think having level two I don't think we want to encourage people parking downtown anyway you know we want them out at the parking garages mm -hmm. so yeah. that's my two cents I think John Aubrey and then Ben yeah, so a couple okay. things, and uh, Jeff, you just touched on one of them. Location-wise, at some point, I think we're going to be looking to make the city more walkable and have fewer cars mm -hmm. downtown. Mm -hmm. So as harsh as it sounds, I, I wouldn't cry too badly if there weren't high-speed charging downtown. Mm -hmm. If we had high-speed charging in High Hanover and Foundry, mm -hmm. that would be great to get the push to people in the garage. Yeah. Um, that said, what I just suggest is as we look out a few years and think about what's the charging station inventory going to look like. I, me personally, I would like Portsmouth to have a reputation with people know, like my Tesla owning son in law is, oh yeah, there's a there are lots of chargers available. Right now there aren't. I mean, we live two streets over from Foundry, yeah. and we generally can't get, I, I wanted to put in a charger in the house, <laughs> because we generally can't find it. So Excuse my thought, Josh, and thank you for those numbers. If we were to look out a couple of years, three years, whatever, I'm thinking maybe a 70, 30, 80, 20 mix of Mm -hmm. level twos in the higher numbers because we can get so many more endpoints. Yes, some number of fast chargers, mm -hmm. but I'd love to see more chargers in more garage based locations and just advertise the heck out of it so people are hearing outside of Portsmouth. Yeah, and, and this gentleman made a great point. We're not trying to get people charged up to 300 miles. We're not. I mean, if we try to do that, we're going to run out of budget after the sixth, the sixth outlet. We're trying to get them to the point where they don't feel the range anxiety, or they feel less of it. Yeah. Um, I think it was Ben, then Aubrey, Kate. Yeah, um, so I think that was a really good counterpoint, Steve, and I, I think what it's kind of leading me to is, is now we're at this, this precipice almost of it's a lot easier for us to just say, let's do level two for now. That's a, that's the, the the path of least resistance. It gets us, and we've been talking about visibility, as a as a group. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a very visible initiative. So I, I, I do agree that the bang for the buck and the visibility, uh, I don't think that should be discounted. I think the need will exist very soon. The demand will exist more acutely for the level three. But I think I see a can of worms digging up downtown with infrastructure projects uh, and then all right we're digging up Market Square and we're digging up Fleet Street or, you know etc what else do we need to change where does the infrastructure need to you know accommodate other new uh, energy draws and, and such things so I think I'm, I'm trying to collect all of my, my many scattered thoughts but I, I think the level two might be a good kind of a first foray but I think we should not, I, th I think it shouldn't be black or white. I think we should not put, to continue the eggs in the basket metaphor, yeah. not put all of our eggs in that basket. We should say, all right, let's put a couple, see how it goes. I think, um, who was it who said cars need to be probably leaving downtown instead of coming in? Mm -hmm. So I think um, the strategic placement will come into play with level three chargers. I think there's going to be infrastructure projects happening in the future, in the near future. <coughs> that would be the perfect point to really, That's fair. To really mm -hmm. uh, you know, sync this. Yes, yeah, so Aubrey and then Kate, I believe. So okay. Um, we're going to run out of time tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, I'll be quick. A couple, a couple of thoughts I have are, are one, um, uh, I'm also pretty down with the bang for the buck thing. I think like two of the level twos is probably more valuable to for visibility than you know one of the level ones. Um, I think you get a lot more um, bang for the buck downtown if people have, I mean, I, I could see those easily being used for somebody who's coming into town, they stop, they park, they go to dinner, maybe they go to the press room, whatever, they, they, they're there for a few hours and that gives them not a full charge, but at least enough that they get that extra 100 miles to get home or, or whatever they need to do. Um, it's sounding like, and I'm not a, a electric car driver myself yet, but there's what, only less than a half a dozen of these in the whole state. So if we're gonna have one of those, I mean, it seems like 
got it the no at the traffic circle or something would be yeah. the perfect spot there's more than that like at seabrook i think now there might be 12. they've been yeah. oh okay so there's, there's a bunch Concord, there maybe eight or ten mm -hmm. but, but like i could That's see the, the the parking lot at the liquor store for example being a perfect spot for those because <laughs> they're I, I mean they're right by the highway there's tons of parking mm -hmm. there um, I mean, maybe it's not the perfect place for somebody to spend a half charging. an hour, but, <laughs> but I mean, that's the type of central location that's easy in, easy out. It's out of downtown. Um, and one last thought I have is $130,000, that's a brand new technology. I bet in like three or four years that's down to $80,000 or less as they get widely adopted. Um, and we may also want to talk with like the utilities because they have every incentive in the world to promote electric driving. So maybe there's some kind of synergies we can do with the utility, like they pay for that 480 line to go in and we pay for the thing or, or mm -hmm. something like that. Maybe there's something that can be done there. Mm -hmm. There are public-private partnerships with um, just builders in general. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they could pay for part of it and advertise on it. But That's exactly what I was going to jump off on. Um, what can we do as far as incentivizing private privately owned lots to put in yeah. chargers. Yeah. We could play around with ordinances a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that it's not all city money. It's we get somebody else to do it for they, us with they, some kind of putting them in. They're, yeah. Yeah. The common man's put it replacing the you know, coming in with a proposal to replace the Burger King across from Water Country and there's chargers at the back of that site. Oh really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think there'll be more on private business because that brings customers yeah. to their especially restaurants and longer stay kind of places mm -hmm. can we put a caveat in about where the power is actually coming from <clears throat> that's tough it's mm -hmm. kind of like so the um, mm -hmm. Congress made a small mistake they put a caveat in the bipartisan funding bill saying that it needs to be American made and I think there's one company that makes American um, DC fast chargers and almost all the parts come from uh, countries that have the minerals like China or wherever else so mm -hmm. okay. awesome did you get enough feedback I did I got the <laughs> feedback I wanted and I could hit on the greenhouse gas inventories and the outdoor dining composting in about uh, a minute apiece Sounds great. so another report back we had requested was one on greenhouse gas inventories currently there's been one every six years just to um, pretty much give a baseline here's where we are here's where we're going the um, last one was in 2018 uh, the question I had asked for was like how best to fund one every year not actually expecting one every year but just that's the initial proposal and um, the city managers response to that was essentially like that should be part of the um, climate action plan mm -hmm. so that makes total sense and then as far as outdoor dining composting um, when did you first come speak here about banning plastic shopping bags eight years ago <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we first 2013? met 2013. Uh, Beck was part of an effort to ban plastic shopping bags. I was an early adopter to it. Fast forward, uh, and um, your sister, Ben, actually helped with this, passed uh, a citywide ban on styrofoam cups and containers, and then a far more comprehensive ban on city property um, to include mandating composting. At the time, there was only six or seven restaurants doing outdoor dining, but the goal for me was always to expand that number and um, impose a penalty. And with outdoor dining now, and um, uh, it's coming back, uh, which I think is a great thing. I had a proposed motion, which would have been half the proposed cost of outdoor dining for all the restaurants, and then charge a fee under this ordinance uh, for the remaining half for those that don't compost. I read the room, it was pretty obvious that people didn't want to charge that much money, period, for anything. So instead I changed the motion, and also on uh, March 7th, the uh, fee committee is going to be meeting, and uh, it was unanimous vote by the city council authorizing us to set a fee for uh, food establishments on city property that do not compost. So it's a step in the right direction, and the reason why there's been a lot of focus on composting is food waste is the third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions due to methane. So um, we'll come up with something, a plan, so there will be a fee. It's not gonna be hundreds, it's not gonna be thousands of dollars, but um, it's a good first step. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Josh. Can, can I take one second here just to, um, Josh is doing an amazing job 
at the city council presenting um, different issues every single meeting it seems on climate issues and um, so I just want to take the opportunity to let you guys know that there's usually something on the agenda and Josh has usually proposed it and um, he's doing a great job advocating for um, this committee and for what what needs to be done so thank you so is there anything Thanks, coming up that we should know about um, the not off the top of my head, but I've been up since 4 30. So. <laughs> <laughs> will be. Um, it is now past 8 30. I know we wanted to talk about sustainable, sustainability visi visibility efforts, which we touched on last time. Bert, do you want to? I would like to move that off okay. and recommend that uh, mm -hmm. we stop the recording if we do a quick checkout. Sounds good. Can I just ask one question before we do that? The mayor brought up doing meetings on Zoom versus this recording, which I think is probably brings more people in, mm -hmm. but it's also something to think about. Do you want more people in? So um, I can set up a Zoom with our agenda. It's easy, and mm -hmm. it does provide people that don't want to go out, especially now, um, with that opportunity. So Doesn't people, it need to be on Zoom if it's a standing committee? Yeah. Or is that not the case right now? I don't know that it is. It, no, it's, I don't know. I lost track of that. Like, <laughs> it's not a requirement because we're not under emergency right. provisions anymore. Okay. Yeah. But I would say, don't be surprised if there are recommendations that come out that everyone mm -hmm. is accessible on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, I would not. I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't see that coming out of governance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, it's a great, I mean, as far as accessibility goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it opens it up to Pretty everyone. Amazing. I'm all for it, yeah. but I, I always prefer to at least have the option to come in. And if other people wanted to, I think we mm -hmm. should continue having the mm -hmm. yeah. physical discussion just because. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. not saying we yeah. shouldn't have the regular meeting. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. would we want to open it up to Zoom to bring more people in or so Epi can do it from Puerto Rico? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that, I think I'll be the back for the next <laughs> <laughs> Um, just for the record, too, I need some clarity on the symposium because I know this committee for the city is sponsoring, but I don't have a good sense of when that is. And so, c can we put that on the agenda for next time? Okay. Great. The symposium. Can you tell me the date now? Do you know? Do you know? Uh, we are in the process of trying to find out. Oh, okay. We're trying to create the path as we walk it. Okay. Thank you. Um, can just one quick thing. Yes, I, I heard Peter on National Public Radio talking about coastal resilience yeah, initiative. Oh, okay. I still haven't heard it. I can't find it. <laughs> it's during the <laughs> hourly update, so it's just All right. sustainable planning. It's great. Good. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Very well done. And I heard Laura Lee on it about two weeks prior. Nice. Really? Awesome. That's great. Fantastic. Awesome. Um, I was just going to say, if um, this, as far as a, a symposium, if it gets pushed at all into 2023, I would highly recommend talking to the Portsmouth 400 folks about schedule. I have, I have some connections there. I think some other people do as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd be happy to. Okay. I think we speed round there at the end, but. And we have to push some things to the next meeting, but it's pretty. Stop the recording. There are worse problems to have. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess we can stop the recording. All right. yeah. Stop the recording. See you.